Welcome, Kofiri, to uh, Scribes at the Rock. Hello, this year, Bella is going virtual, so uh, this is the way we're going to be doing the, the interviews across uh, Zoom. You're very, very welcome. And normally, I would uh, introduce you to an audience of about 200 people in the upstairs lounge at the Rock Bar, and uh, afterwards, I would take you out to dinner. So, <laughs> this, this, this interview is proven to be uh, a bit of a save for, for Bella in terms of our funding. Uh, I want to talk to you about, obviously, you painted your third book, but I'm sure our viewers, before we get on to that subject, would be fascinated to hear your personal history and how you arrived on the shores of Ireland 30 years ago and nobody warned you about the weather, uh, <laughs> and how you came to be writing a book about an Irish regiment uh, based on the, the real life events of the Connacht Rangers yeah. you know, 100 years ago, based in India, heard about the atrocities of the Black and Tans and uh, mutinied. So before we go into the book proper, I'd just like you to talk about your life, please. Okay, Danny, so thank you so much for having me on. I'm just so delighted uh, because for me, it's, it's, a, it's a full circle nearly because, and, I, and I'll explain to you why, but before I go on to that, I uh, just want to say, I'm so delighted to be here and uh, I'm going to hold you to that dinner next year. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, for, for me, as I said, you know, it's a full circle because when I came to Ireland uh, 34 years ago, I actually landed in Belfast. So it's wonderful to be on your, uh, on your pro festival program this year. Um, you know, the year I've written my third book, which is, you know, based on an Irish regiment. So um, when we arrived uh, in, in Belfast, when I arrived in Belfast in February of 1986, um, you know, it was, um, I, 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 I came because I was an accompanying spouse, as they would, as they would say in, in, the, in the, you know, the legal terms. Uh, my husband was a junior doctor in uh, working in Sligo, and uh, that's what brought us to Ireland. That's what brought us to Ireland. And did you, what did you work at when you first came here? Uh, my, my own self, no, no, because you know, in those days, uh, just because your, your, your husband or your wife had a visa, you didn't get a working visa. So no, I, I didn't work. I, I, was, I was just at home. You know, uh, sort of how long did you stay in Sligo before you're currently living in County Kildare? Yeah, we were in Sligo for about 18 months and uh, then moved away to, to Norwich and to Cumbria for three years between the Lake District in England and Norwich for three years and then came back to Ireland and haven't left since. Haven't left very since. good, very yeah. good. Yeah. Okay, well, let's talk about uh, The Tainted. It's a, a tragic love story, but of course, it's more than that. It's a an observation and a critique of imperialism, colonialism, the yeah. caste system. And uh, I mean, I was fascinated by, uh, and a bit surprised because of course the, the story begins in 1920 and the 1920s are, are mentioned subsequently. But then of course it's divided into two parts whenever the, mm. the grandson of the commanding officer of the, of the Kilbergs uh, comes back to India, I think it's 1982, and he's very, very much attracted to this young woman, May Twomey, who is the granddaughter of the soldier who was involved in the mutiny, uh, Michael Flaherty, and yes. who was executed. Uh, but even at that, whenever, whenever uh, is it Charles? No, Richard. Whenever Richard comes back to India, in 1982, what surprised me is this is 30 years after independence, mm. and yet the obsequiousness, the deferential attitude towards him is, is incredible. And uh, I was just surprised at that 30 years after independence. Yeah, and I, I think that you, you know, it's very hard to shake off, um, you know, subjugation and uh, you know, deference and doffing your cap at the white man in India you know it was it was hard to shake it off it's I think it's nearly gone now uh, but even even now like in in, in 2020 you know there, there is a fascination with white skin uh, if I could if I could just call it that uh, not so much a deference but definitely a, a, an intense fascination with, with white you know with, with white skin with the common man in India you know they would be quite fascinated by it. 
but in the 80s there was definitely you know a certain degree it was only about 45 years post independence mm -hmm. um and uh, you, you know there was still you know that that degree of deference towards uh, towards white people because they were the ruling class for so long for so many years um yeah it's interesting that uh, that you observed that you know because i I, I and I, I think I try to explain, um, uh, and you know, to explain that the personal, the personal circumstance of of the of the people who um, you know f feature in the book, in in the sense that when Richard goes back to India uh, in the eighties, you know, he he comes across people who had served his grandfather, or you know, people who yes. yeah. So there. In that case, it's more um, loyalty because you know Indian servants were known for their extreme loyalty. You know, even although, they were, a, although ironically, in uh, Paul Scott's book, staying on, the the colonel who stays on with his wife Lucy. Yes, and yes. And Lucy, they experience the reverse. They yes, now yes, as yeah, the second yeah, class, yeah, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. uh, imposters. Yes, uh, yes. Which is is quite funny. No, I, it struck me that everyone, uh, or all of the characters, even including Father Jerome, the chaplain to the regiment, mm. they all suffer from this uh, either overt or subconscious racism, where even Rose, who is, to use that pejorative term, a, a half-caste, the young yes. woman, at the 18-year-old woman at the beginning yes. of the novel, who, who was actually born... In a, in a home for illegitimate children, because mm. obviously her father uh, was uh, European, right? Uh, she has a she looks down upon the natives, and yeah. Father Jerome comes off with some exceptional racist comments, and it's just th it's just through throughout uh, all of the characters, they're all victims of this. And the other thing that also impressed me. Uh, I mean, the small number of soldiers that are based at the Hill Station of Nandagiri, I think it is. Uh, how a tiny garrison of a few thousand soldiers managed to hold down on behalf of Empire, a, a subcontinent of yeah. a 90, yeah. 20, I don't know what the population was, maybe four or five hundred million people. It's, it's incredible. Right. And I think it's got to do with the, 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 we're made to think that we're slaves. We're made to think that we're second yeah. class. Yeah. And this small, mm -hmm. these people can rule us, then they must be superior. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, it's looking back at, at the, the tragedy of that uh, in terms of, of what happens to all, all of the characters. Uh, I heard you say somewhere, I think I heard you say somewhere that Father Jerome was perhaps one of your favorite characters. I wonder if Absolutely. you Absolutely. I wonder if yeah. you justify that. Well, I th and I think. Uh, to, to a certain extent, it is because he, I hadn't planned him to be such a major character in the book. You yes. know, he was just somebody who, when I wrote the first few chapters, just appeared. I, I, honest to God, Danny, that's exactly what happened. He just appeared <laughs> and then kind of took, not took over, but you know, he, as you know, you've read the book, he's a huge part of the first half of the book. And yes. a lot of his actions, uh, you know, and, and inactions as well uh, are the cause of the second part of the book. So, um, and I think, you know, it's interesting. I, I actually really loved him and I, I, I warmed to him. I was sympathetic with him. I think he was, uh, you know, he was exemplary in his, um, you know, in his, in the way he looked after his, his, uh, you know, his flock. Um, yes. and Although he still, he still, he, he goes to dinner, he goes to tea in somebody's house. Might be Rose's aunt's, I'm not sure. That's right. Yes. And, yes. And and he, he's looking down upon the food and what they're offering him, etc. My favourite character, actually, and he only appears fleetingly, but he's crucial to the plot. Is it Doctor Swami? Yes. Yes. I mean, yeah. I, I I could have read, uh, you know, another uh, fifty thousand words about him. I thought he was great, a great portrayal. And of course, his intervention, without yeah, uh, spoiling yeah. it, uh, is is crucial uh, towards the to, the to the final sting in the tail. Not a sting in the tail; it's a surprise in the end. It's a, a beautiful end and very moving end to to the book, which, which obviously you. took me 
surprise, surprise. I was yeah. not expecting yeah. Yeah. I was not expecting So yeah. how did you get, what attracted you to this story? Well, uh, I happened to be, I had just finished my second book and, um, you know, it was in, in between projects really and um, came, just came across it completely by accident, uh, Danny. I was in the Indian embassy at a function in the Indian embassy and uh, overheard a conversation about uh, how the Irish flag might have been the inspiration for the Indian flag. And, uh, you know, the, I think there's a legend, a myth, really. I don't think it's true, but uh, a lot of people like to say that uh, when the Union Jack was pulled down on the parade grounds in Jalandhar at the time of the mutiny and the Irish uh, tricolor was raised, uh, apparently a lot of Indian nationalists were very curious as to, you know, what's the flag that came down and what is this flag that's gone up and uh, took inspiration for the, for the Indian flag from the Irish flag. So I overheard this conversation and immediately came home, never had never heard of the mutiny and actually wasn't even aware at that stage that there were that many, you know, that, that the Irish presence in India was that huge and, and for so long, you know, for over 300 years. So when I came home and had a look, uh, you know, the next day, did a quick, uh, you know, search, and realized uh, to my delight, you know, that there was a story waiting to be told, you know, the story of the mutiny. But once I started writing it, Danny, as, and you know, because you've read the book, it actually became a story of the aftermath of the mutiny because, yes. you know, as I started writing, I realized the real story, the real human story was in the, was the story of the progeny, the, the many, many thousands of uh, you know children mixed race children that were left behind by irishmen in india and i picked i picked uh, you know um, rose and what happened to her and her family uh, to be to be central to the story but they represent all of the people all of the children of irish soldiers that were left behind in india have, have the numbers ever been uh, fully quantified well, as a group, um, you know, as a group, the Anglo-Indians would at the, at the, at the height would have uh, numbered in millions, you know, maybe, you know, 10, 15 million. But at the moment in India, they've dwindled to about, you know, three or 400,000 uh, because most of them have, have emigrated. Um, you know, they've left, they've, they've gone to Canada, they've gone to Australia, they've, you know, they moved to the UK as well. But in India, that distinction wouldn't have been made over the years. You know, that distinction that, oh, you know, my father was Irish or Scott or Welsh or English wouldn't have been made. Everybody was clubbed together as English because, you know, it was the yeah. English that were ruling us. And, uh, you know, in amongst Indians, there wouldn't have been that, you know, that complete distinction. And very often I say to people, you know, when, when you see a South Asian person in, in Ireland, for example, you know, People would just say, "Oh, that you, oh, that Pakistani doctor, or oh, that Indian doctor." But yeah. there is such a huge distinction between Bangladeshis, Pakistanis, um, you know, Nepalis, Indians, and Sri Lankans, and we don't like to be mistaken for each other. Just like, <laughs> you know, uh, we, just like we don't like to be mistaken for the yeah, Indians. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so the the, the, the tainted uh, of the title, of course, refers to uh, several. Uh, yeah, groups several. Of people. Yes. You know, yeah. young Rose who, who falls pregnant, and uh, even if even if she had been uh, white, would not have been allowed to get married because our soldiers uh, abroad weren't allowed to get married. I think for, for seven years. Seven years, like yeah. yeah. Uh, so she she's tainted. Uh, the Irish soldiers who are serving overseas, just like those who were serving in World War One when Easter nineteen sixteen. That's right. Yeah. The returnees are tainted. Tainted, yeah. They were, they were affected. Although a very small number of them uh, went into the IRA and, of course, trained the IRA, people like like uh, Tom, Tom Barry, Don Bray, etc. Yes, yes. Uh, so they, so there's all of these people who are tainted, including uh, obviously those who have to are left behind the Anglo Anglo uh, Indian. Uh, so I mean, it covers it covers many many layers. I, w I would like you to actually. For our viewers, uh, would you read an extract from the book, yes, please, and I, put it into context? I would love to. I would love to actually. And I, the, the extract I picked actually is very appropriate because uh, it, it's 
it's to do with um, well this is just michael uh, my main character michael flaherty is just thinking uh, about his relationship with uh, you know his the problems of his relationship with this mixed race girl whose father is an irish soldier but whose mother is herself half caste so you know she's just thinking about his his um, you know his involvement with her and what what it entails so i'll just read for you now Michael knew he would never be given permission to marry Rose. The military rules were strict and clear. Marriage for young soldiers was forbidden. It was difficult enough for senior NCOs who were considered very fortunate if they had managed to put their wives and children on the regimental books. There was always a scramble for that privilege, despite the fact that married soldiers led a hard life with very cramped quarters and little or no social facilities. What's more, Michael had signed on for seven years with the Colours, with a regiment that could be sent to any part of the empire at any time. Seven years before he could ask permission to, be, to marry. No wonder the lads in B Company thought him a bloody fool to have got tangled up with the Baconwala's daughter. He could think of no one to turn to for advice, except Father Jerome. For Sergeant Tom Nolan had been totally dismissive about Rose, warning Michael that Eurasian girls were always on the lookout for a quick and legitimate passage out of India. You'll be making a right idiot of yourself, he scoffed. Nobody waits seven years in India. Jesus, lad, that's time enough for an entire family to be dead and buried in these climes. And anyway, what's to stop her from latching on to some other gullible sod the minute the rangers get posted out of Nandagiri? Tom had then dug him in the ribs, haven't you heard the cavalry regiments got a dashing figure in their uniforms? She won't wait seven days for you, lad, when one of those young stallions come riding by. And I can tell you, even the cavalry fellows won't be fool enough to take the likes of her home. When he protested that the bacon waller would take his daughter back to Ireland himself, Tom had told him straight, you ask me what I thought and I'll tell it to you as I see. Assuming she'll wait for you seven years, Jesus, she'll be an old maid. Haven't you seen what the weather does to women out here in the East? And think of it, man, your children could turn out to be darkies. When blood's diluted, the color will always come through. It wouldn't be fair on the poor things. What would they do back in our clock? You'd have to pick the ones to take and the ones to leave behind. Ask Rose why her mother was in an orphanage. I bet you she wasn't white enough to take home, that's why. And why do you think Sean Toomey, the bacon waller, married her? It was because no white woman worth her salt would have wanted to marry an old Irishman gone native. So he goes to the orphanage and picks a girl, as light a one as possible, and does her the big favor of marrying her. Color can skip a generation, you know, Michael, so you might get a few nasty surprises on the way. Tom had stopped to take a long drink from his bottle of beer before putting his elbows on the table and confiding. And you can be sure the bacon waller won't be going home. He's been saying that for 20 years or more, since the day his time up was up with the Rangers. Why would he want to go back to the hovel of a cottage in West Cork when he can live here with a bungalow to call his own, a business that more than pays the bills and native servants salaming him night and day? The daughter may have notions of all kinds, but Sean Toomey is no fool. He's a tradesman now with a good name and a reputation. Sure, there's no living to be made down that sodden boreen that he was born in. He finished, and then he finished sternly. You don't be a damn fool yourself, Michael, and don't let her make one of you. Thank you for that. <laughs> uh, tell me this here, there, you've got fantastic coverage, I have to say, I'm really jealous of you. You've appeared so many <laughs> Uh, newspapers and doing interviews, etc. I mean, I, I, I take it you've been uh, really pleased with the amount of reviews and attention. Yeah, absolutely. Um, because as you know, Danny, my publisher is quite, they're quite small, but very, very proactive, Hope Road Publishing in the UK. And, um, you know, they've, they've really sort of uh, pushed to, to get me into as many, you know, outlets as possible for reviews and things. But, to be honest, I the book launch, my book launch was on the 23rd of April, like smack bang in the middle of the lockdown. <laughs> Lucky you. Yeah, but it in just, you know, what a stroke of uh, 
I don't know, fate or whatever you might want to call it, people had to read. There was nothing else to do. And so, you know, I, I actually got read by, by editors and books editors and reviewers who may not have had the time to read me and, you know, from oh, my no. small publishing house. So, you know, in a way, the lockdown worked out okay for me, you know, to my advantage nearly. Well, um, I reviewed the book for the Irish Examiner. I'm not sure if it has appeared yet. But uh, the, 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 your, your beautiful passages, beautiful prose. Oh, you know, thank you. <laughs> it's great. You're very evocative, atmospheric uh, accounts of the, uh, you know, the, the wildlife, of the vegetation, uh, the, of the heat, and the threat yeah. also to the, to the, to the uh, Europeans. You know, in a way, it, it reminded me of uh, the Raj Quartet, another uh, false fact. Oh, my God, that's, that's how you praise <laughs> Well, I, I mean, I, I, I mean, I loved, I loved, I loved Paul Scott's writing, but it did. Yeah. I meant, I, by the way, I mentioned this in the Irish Examiner. Oh, I can't <laughs> wait to read it as well. So you can put that on the cover of your next book. I will for sure. Uh, tell me this here: How long did it take you to write the book? Because I'm sure our viewers would be interested. They always ask this of authors. You know, your writing habits. Do you yeah. have an attic? Do you require total silence? Uh, do you work to specific hours? Do you have a particular color of pen, etc.? <laughs> well, it took me, uh, in, when I started writing this book, I really immersed myself in that period, you know, in the 1920s. So I, I only read, whether it was fiction or nonfiction, I only read, you know, from the 1920s to about the 1940s. In that period, I watched films, documentaries. I, you know, totally immersed myself in in that uh, period so i i did a lot of uh, i'd made a uh, several trips to india and uh, you know danny i did just to explain that the reason why the book was set in south india was you know and i when i started writing the book it was to be the story of the mutiny of the connacht rangers yeah. but but within three chapters i knew that i would have to fictionalize the regiment because you know i would be putting words into mouths of of people whose descendants are still around, you know. Yeah. So I decided to change it, change the regiment's name to the Kildare Rangers since I'm from Kildare. And because I did that, then that gave me the flexibility to move the location of the mutiny from North India, where it actually happened, to South India, where I'm originally from. And so when I did my research, it was easy for me then to go back, you know, to the hills of uh, of of the Nilgiri Hills, which are which are a real a real and true mountain range. And I went, uh, I trekked there uh, with a guide for, for many weeks, um, you know, getting to know the flora, the fauna of the thing. And I hope that came across in the book. Oh, absolutely. My absolute it's love for the place. Part. It's a, be a beautiful active dimension to the book. You know, yeah. It, it, it so, took, uh, so it took me, it. yeah. So it took me, it took me about five or six years of research. And of course it was, you know, the research was so enjoyable that uh, I actually had to say to myself, no, no, you have to stop and actually start writing the book. So I'd say it took me, you know, about five or six years of research and then about, about five and a half uh, or six years of writing. Wow. But it was, it was broken up, uh, Danny, because, you know, halfway through I actually had a, I suffered a stroke. And that, that was a bit of a setback, you know. Uh, so it took seemed, me a little while. You seem to have fully recovered from that. Yes, I'm fully, totally. I had a, I had a miraculous recovery. So, uh, you know, I had a full-blown stroke. I, I lost my speech and was paralyzed on my left, fully paralyzed my left side. Uh, but as you can see, I had a, I had an amazing recovery. And then my, when I, when I had this miraculous, you know, uh, one day suddenly came, everything came back. I, I just sort of, you know, was became quite obsessed with staying fit and. You know, so I started playing golf and that took me down a completely different road. And so the book got neglected, you know. Uh, is, your next, but then, is, your next, is your next book about golf? <laughs> no, but my next character is going to be a caddie on a golf course. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so th th that was the process of writing the book. You know, a lot of research and then a long period of writing. Um, and then the book languished for a while, you know, when I wasn't, wasn't well. Then I, I actually went back to it, you know, I was actually uh, sort of, uh, I, I knew I had to finish it. I knew I had a good, a good story to tell. Well, so, it's, a, yeah. it's a, a brilliant book. It's a book to be proud of. 
Oh, and, thank you. Uh, and, I, and I hope that many people go out and get it. Uh, I'm not sure if they can see this. Oh. Cover of it, beautiful cover. And uh, what 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 is your next book you mentioned there? A reference to a character being a caddy in it. Yeah, well, uh, my next book is is going to be set entirely in India, and it's fiction. But I have three sets of Irish characters in the book who will who will figure in the book who are real people, you know, who, who are real people. So uh, one of them, I, I mean, I don't know, I don't know all all the characters, but I know that one of them is going to be um, the 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 couple that you might actually you might know of, uh, Danny, the the Margaret and uh, James cousins. You know, right. uh, so so Margaret and James Cousins went out to India in the 1913, in that period, you know, between 1913 and 1916. Um, you know, they'd been, she had been hugely involved in the suffragette movement here. She would have been a contemporary of, um, you know, all, all the, the women who, who, who I, I think she may have been a I think she may have been imprisoned at one stage. Yes, yes, she was imprisoned as well. Yes, yes. So, you know, she would have been a contemporary of uh, Countess Markwitz and, and uh, Han Hannah Skeffington, you know, the, all of them, you know. So when they went out to India, um, they established, uh, he, James Cousins actually ran a nationalist newspaper in India and, you know, was, they were heavily involved in the Indian freedom struggle, they were heavily involved in the Indian national, nationalist movement. And incredibly now this is she's very well known amongst academics and historians but she was the first the first female magistrate in india can you believe it you know like it's such an amazing thing like i didn't know that you know myself and i was just so amazed and uh, she was also the first she was the first president of the indian uh, the women's national congress what year you know? was that uh, I think that would have been in the mid 30s. I'm not. I'm not entirely certain because I have. Was the, the Congress a prescribed organization at that stage? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So she. She. I think she was a president for a few years, and then when she she felt that there was enough Indian women to take over the helm, she just stepped down. But um, you know, it's again another little known fact is that, you know, the 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 poet Rabindranath Tagore. Pardon. Uh, the poet Rabindranath Tagore, yes, who, yes. In Tagore, who was a very good friend of Yeats, uh, yes. you know, he visited their school uh, in South India, the school that James and Margaret Cousins ran. And um, he recited a poem to the school, to the school one evening. And she was so taken with, taken up with the, with the poem that she overnight, she set the poem to music and got her her students to sing it back to him the next evening. And believe it or not, Danny, that is our Indian national anthem. Really? Yeah. That's so, yeah. So, you know, like, it, and that's not, that's not myth or legend. That is a well-documented fact. And when I went to India in February, I actually went to visit the school, you know, what remains of that school is now college actually. Um, and, you know, I, I was in the room where, where this happened. Uh, in the hall where, where this, you know, where this happened. And I mean, it's an incredible story, you know, and she, um, she actually, uh, James Cousins died in India, uh, but because of the, the huge involvement in the freedom struggle, uh, they were very well known to the Gandhi family, you know, the, the Nehru Gandhi family. And um, she, um, she stayed on in India. She had a stroke in India. But be, be, as a as a mark of respect to her, uh, she was allowed. The, the government gave her a huge stipend. You know, uh, yeah. Jawaharlal Nehru himself, the prime minister, gave her a massive stipend. Uh, you know, for for her to live out her life in comfort in India, and she she died in India. I think yeah, I, I could be wrong, but uh, you know, she she sort of lived out her life in India. When can we look forward to seeing this in print? So, so, the, so she's one of the she's one of the characters in the book, but she's not the main character. My main character is going to be a gardener in her house, right? You know, and he's he this it's she's going to figure you know in in a sort of maybe a ten year period in his life. Uh, so I have three, I have three uh, Irish characters who are who are historic real characters, and they're going to feature in this in my fictional man's house. Uh, sorry, in the life of this fictional character, you know. 
Well, uh, in order to come out to dinner, you're going to have to come up and do a reading from that book. I will, I will. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> I look it's forward to it. it. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. And uh, I wish you well in, your, in the current writing. And also, uh, I hope everyone goes out and buys The Tainted. What a wonderful, beautiful story. Thank Very you, much. Danny. Thank you. I was so lucky that you read my book and liked it. <laughs> Thank you. Take care.